Let's talk about rock climbing. <laughs> Our next guest climbed a bare rock that is taller than the tallest building in the world, 3,000 feet without ropes, just some shoes and a tiny backpack. That kind of climb without any gear is called free soloing. And on Saturday, Alex Honnold became the first person to ever free solo El Capitan, the towering vertical rock formation in Yosemite National Park. It is something that people have talked about and dreamed about doing for years. That includes Alex. And we have reached him, actually, on top of El Capitan. So you went back up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. How's the, how's the view? It's outrageous. The high country is really snowy this year because there's such a big winter in California. Okay, so I just want to be totally clear here. What you did on Saturday, I'm just going to say it again so people can understand the magnitude of it. You climbed a bare rock that is 3,000 feet tall with no ropes. How long have you been planning on doing this? So I've been climbing for over 20 years, I guess. This route on El Cap, I've been sort of dreaming about on and off for maybe the last eight or nine years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's always it's always been kind of a vague dream, but then it just seems too daunting. And I mean, it's pretty intimidating. Every time you drive into Yosemite and you see El Cap, you're like, whoa, yeah, a big wall. Okay, so how did you work on it? Like, how does a person prepare for something like this? So, I mean, specifically for the route that I sold, I, I prepared by, by climbing the route many times to make sure that I could physically do it. And then I also spent a lot of time with ropes by myself, rappelling down from the summit so I could work on individual sections or memorize or moves or like mark certain holds with chalk so I could remember things. The bigger thing, though, is probably the psychological side of it, like somehow feeling like you're ready to, to climb a wall like that. And that that was sort of a longer process, I suppose. Yeah. How does that work? Like, what do you do? Are you somebody who, like, meditates? Do you sleep a lot? Like, what's the plan? <laughs> I do probably <laughs> sleep a lot, but that's just because I'm tired all the time. <laughs> um, you know, I've sort of built my tolerance up over time until it seems possible to do something this big. So mental tolerance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, you have your little bubble, like your comfort zone, and you slowly expand it until until it can accommodate something really huge. Hmm. Um, the route you're talking about, it's called the free rider route up the mountain. I understand there's a part um, along the route where you have to do a karate kick. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the crux of the route. It's probably the most difficult section on the entire 3,000-foot wall. And it's maybe... A 10 moves total that are quite difficult and they culminate in, in sort of a karate kick to get your foot over to this other corner. I just, that is something that I just can't really find myself understanding. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it takes a little building up too. But there has to be on some level at some point some fear. Like how would you describe what your relationship with fear is like? I mean, yeah, there is a little bit, and and certainly it was fear that has kept me from doing it for so long. I mean, I've dreamt about this since 2009, and and this is the first year I've actually felt ready. And that's because I'd always look at the wall and, you know, be full of dread. (laughs) Like the rest of us. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'd always look at it and be like, oh, no. But then over the last few years, that perspective started to shift a little bit, and then and then this last year, I've thought that I could do it. And then, and once you believe that it's possible, and you start working towards it, then it sort of becomes inevitable. The the uh, the question that has to be asked, like, how did it feel when you got up there on Saturday? I was, I was, I was, just, I, I don't even know how to say. It. I was so elated. Actually, even just thinking about it, I just got the biggest smile again. I'm sure I was babbling for like quite a while because I was just so <laughs> so excited. I, I felt so good too physically, like it's because I'd gone quite quickly, and so you know I was like, oh, I could do this again. I feel great. <laughs> like let's, you know, I was like, let's do it. So it's like, but um, but then by the time I got down, I was like, no, actually, I'm kind of tired. But and we should be clear too, like a thing that took you four hours usually takes other people days. Yeah, I think the average party probably spends about three days on the wall. Wow. You've set, you've set a new standard now, right? You've like set the bar higher. Do you think about the fact that now more people are going to try to do it? I don't know. People always ask if doing big free solos is going to encourage people to go soloing. And the reality is that it just doesn't. I mean, the thing about soloing is you have to be, you have to be very passionate about it and you have to be, you know, self-driven. And it's just, it's, it's quite scary if you're not doing it for the right reasons. So, I mean, if you decide that you want to go soloing because you think it's cool and you just want to be cool and you want to be the man, you know, basically, once you get a little ways off the ground, self-preservation kicks in. You're like, I don't really want to go much higher. Yeah. But the thing with soloing is that uh, you're making 
thousands of intentional movements. You know, you're choosing to move higher over and over and over for, for hours. And so, I mean, you have to be pretty motivated. You can't just, like, rush into that. Alex Hanhol is a mountain climber and the first person to free solo El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. He talked to us from the top of El Cap. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Hi, everybody. It's Todd Taco, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. Thank you, NPR, for that interview. I, I really wanted to talk about this with you um, for a lot of reasons. One is it caught a lot of news. And two is because I think it's a really interesting way to think about and talk about risk. Um, and it's topical. It's, it's timely. It's, it's, it's on target. In fact, it only happened a couple weeks ago. That's about as timely as I get on the, on the podcast. But to have this conversation, I think we first had to listen to the passion that the, the, the climber had, that Alex had for this, this activity. And it wasn't just the passion that allowed him to be successful. It was the experience. It was the technical competency. It was the confidence. It was the ability. It was the support. It was the time. All of those things play together to create expertise. And one of the things that I think is so vital, and if you listen much to Corey Pitzer, and many of you have, he's a great friend, and I never mind talking about Corey Pitzer. Corey says, we don't want workers who are afraid of risk. We want workers who are competent around risk. And I thought, there's not a better place I can go to talk about this notion of risk competence than, than here, than to this experience to this climber, to Alex's experience, and to the fact that he did something that hadn't been done before hundreds of times faster than anybody normally does it, and he did it by himself alone, and he managed it successfully the entire way. And and it's that ability to learn from success, that ability to leverage that experience, that risk competence, that's what makes Alex so interesting. And and I want to challenge you to think about risk. (laughs) Risk is really interesting because for the most part, risk is very exportable. It's it's always movable. And in fact, our organizations sell risk to companies who want to buy the risk. And and that happens everywhere. We we sell high risk work and, and you work in organizations where where you do that, or, or many of you that are listening to this podcast, we, we sell that risk out and so people have the ability to buy that risk from us and take on these high risk, um, uh, high consequence jobs because they have high payoffs, they have, they have high profitability. And to a great extent, that balance between risk and production, uh, that's really important for us to talk about openly because the more risky the work becomes, the higher the reward is in performing the work and the more willing we are as an organization to export that risk to somebody who wants that risk. So that's kind of where we are. We got to talk about then what that means for us as it relates to to risk. And to do that, I want to challenge some of the way we think about understanding risk. And I want to challenge it in kind of a new way. Uh, maybe it might not be that new to you, but, but to some of you, this is going to be pretty new because your organization spends most of its time managing potential consequence. In, in fact, it's a pretty good bet that if I came into your office right now, uh, first of all, it'd be weird because somehow I climbed the fence, but I got in nonetheless. But if I came into your office right now, it's a pretty good bet I'd find some kind of way where we quantify risk. Maybe it's a stoplight chart. So, you know, we have red, green, yellow. Red's highest risk, highest possible consequence. Yellow's medium. Green's good to go. It's safe. It's controlled. Everything seems good. Or maybe we've got the the chart that's got high and low, high and low. So high probability, low severity. You know, the classic sort of way we define risk. So you have uh, high probability, high severity. That's high risk. Low probability, low severity, that's low risk. And then we sort of, we can build a four-part grid that sort of moves risk. Some of you guys have more than four parts because some of you guys are overachievers. You'll have six-part grids or eight-part grids, all right? But, but there are ways that you sort of quantify this, this, this thing, risk. And it's tough because risk is not a thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like time or temperature. I mean, risk is a word 
that describes something else. So, you know, temperature is not a thing. Temperature is a word that describes something else. So what is the temperature? Currently in Santa Fe, New Mexico on this beautiful day, it's about 78 degrees. I know the rest of you are probably quite a bit hotter, except for you guys in the Southern Hemisphere where you're probably quite a bit cooler, but it's a beautiful day here and why I'm inside recording podcasts, I have no idea, but that's a different story, right? Well, that's how risk is. And so you want to think about risk like you think of the word temperature, and, and you want to think about the fact that we manage risk in real time. But this, this way of thinking about that really changes because I, I think this idea that there's probability of risk changes the way we build risk competence. So in other words, we try to remove the risk, which is a great idea. But what happens is we also move the worker's ability to manage the risk. So you probably couldn't climb El Capitan if you didn't experience and practice in a controlled way to learn how to manage the actual risk. And that is a very, very valuable part of the way we think about it. Here's, here's kind of what I would share with you. Let's think about the difference between the word surprise and the word expected. Right? They seem to be kind of opposites, right? Surprise, I have no expectation. Expected, I have no surprise. They, they're, they're good words to use for this. That's kind of the beginning grounds of how we think about risk. And, and, and that's way different from probability, which is some kind of calculus between surprise and expected. I think we have to think in more certain terms. And, and that becomes really important to understanding climbing El Capitan alone, solo climb without ropes, right? If the things that hurt workers are the same things that kill workers, so free climbing El Cap, that's a really good example of that, right? Then organizationally, what we have to do is manage prevention and competence. Make sense? Right? Because that's kind of no surprises. That's expected. That, that the things that hurt people are the very same things that kill people. And I actually think that form of safety, I'm not going to make a value judgment. That's up to you guys. You can sort of make that decision here in the car as you're listening to this. That form of safety is, is, is probably different than its opposite. And the opposite form of safety is, if the things that hurt people in your organization are not the things that kill people, right? So now we're talking about the difference between ankle sprains and hand cuts, my two favorite examples for things that hurt people, right? Then our organization really has to count on control and recoverability. And, and the reason this separation of these ideas is important for us to even think about today is because... I kind of think we do it the other way around. Now, it's up to you. I mean, this, this is just a, it's a conversation. It's a podcast. It's the same podcast. It's been the same podcast for years. I think we look at sort of these events, the things that hurt people also being the same things that kill people. We look at those and we say, you know, we need to put the best controls, uh, most rigid controls, mitigate, remove, blah, 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 all, the, all kind of the normal hierarchy discussion we have around that. And we think we're good. I, I'm just not sure that keeps us going. I think what we count on in high-risk work that can kill people is, in fact, we we manage really pretty well the worker competence. And then they manage, because they're competent workers, the controls need to be in place to actually make the work happen. That really is a, an opportunity for us to think differently about risk. It's the other side of this. The things that hurt people are not the same things that kill people. That's where I think we have to manage the ability to recover. And it's just the difference between expecting the event and being surprised by the event. And that, I think, is really quite remarkable. So you think about Alex climbing this mountain, right? I think the outcome, the risk, was really clear and really quite expected. And what he counted on was really not a, a series of controls. He built competence and and that's really it strikes me as competence is really a very strong prevention tool and a very strong control tool but prevention competence comes from experience from trying the job many many times in a very controlled environment knowing that it'll fail and probably failing 
It'd be really fun. I, I wish I could talk to them. Maybe I should try to call him. I'd like to talk to him because I'd like to ask him how many times he's fallen because you know there's going to be many times because what makes him a good climber is the ability to fall, get up, recover, um, and climb again. This thinking is really a challenge for us, and I don't have any answers. Uh, I, I've, I've been thinking about it a while, but I don't really know what to say other than we had a young man who climbed El Capitan without the aid of the very basic safety components and he did it successfully. Should we celebrate that or should we punish it? Right? That, that is where we are in the way we think about high risk work. And it goes right back to Corey Pitzer. We don't want workers who are afraid of risk. We really want workers who are challenged by and become competent of the risk that they encounter when they do their work. And that's a really different way to think about this problem. Who knows? I mean, really, who knows what that all means? But it's definitely worth us taking some time to talk about on the podcast. And that's what we did today. What a nice thing. That's the podcast for today. Everything is going marvelous, swimmingly for me. The summer is just zooming by. I've had many trips to Copenhagen, Denmark, because that's what I'm doing. Special thanks to those guys at Maersk. They've been very helpful, and it's been kind of fun to do that ride. Uh, I've got lots of plane stories because, you know, no flight can go unencumbered. Uh, There's always got to be some kind of mess-ups. Everything else is going great, though. I'm really enjoying the summer. trying to spend as much time as I can just hanging out. I hope to see you. We had a great time at HPRCT. I think I only made a few enemies uh, around the topic of root cause, which is uh, always somewhat controversial. And probably it's time for us to change that language. But I don't know. I could be wrong. I was certainly told I was wrong. Other than that, everything's great. The new book is doing marvelous. If you don't have a copy, it's called Workplace Fatalities. It's funny. Uh, the things we talked about in this little podcast today are kind of in that book. So if you haven't had the chance to pick it up, um, you can pick it up. It's available any place you buy books. Amazon comes to mind. Uh, there's a Kindle edition that's doing really well that if you want to read it immediately. I actually think the hardback or the not hardback, the, it's a softback copy of the book, but the, the hard copy of the book is good because you can take notes on it as well. Purchase it. It's on sale right right now so it's a good time to buy it um i think it's worth you reading even if you disagree with it greatly because i think the discussion is um is a pretty good discussion i spent a lot of time looking at catastrophic failure fatalities for the most part and it really has changed the way i think about fatalities and the feedback on it is remarkable so i got an email just today from a gentleman who read the book and said this really changes the way we think about managing high-risk operations in our organization. We've kind of thought this is the right idea. This has given us a little bit more time and discussion to actually move in a, in a, in a different direction. So I, I think you'll find it to be a good book. You ought to pick it up. I don't want to promo stuff too long, but it's probably worth listening to. Until then, my friends, I hope you get what you need. That's really important to me. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>